My Millionaire, a work close to completion but still in progress, has been recorded using Zoom and edited to include a short overture and a PowerPoint introduction, as well as to remove most flaws. In the final 15 minutes, we deleted the picture of the actor who somehow turned out to be the only one on Zoom view. You will, however, hear the entire dialogue of that section. Although there are 17 songs in this musical, you will hear only a few of some we recorded before the pandemic and inserted into this work. The lyrics of the other songs you will hear read as poems. We ask your indulgence. The Heritage Village Theatre Guild actors will now introduce themselves. I'm Judy Cowan and I play Mrs. Worth. Hi, I'm Neil Cowan and I play um, Scrunge, Lloyd Hastings, and George St. George. Hi, I'm Ron Dukensky, and I play Henry Adams. Hi, I'm Floyd Higgins, and I play the moderator, Roger and Perry. Hi, I'm Jack Lampiazzi, and I play the parts of Jack and Ambassador Worth. Hi. I'm Karen Lampiazzi, and I play the part of Portia and Elsie. Hello, I'm Clint McGowan. I'm playing the parts of Sydney, Hoggy, and Chester. Hello, I'm Jim Pine, and I will be playing the parts of the Captain, Archie, Pomfret, Todd, and the Butler. Hi, I'm Elaine Reedy. I'm playing the part of Jane and also Mrs. Barlow. Hi, I'm Nancy True and I'll be playing the part of Peg and Kitty. To assist viewers in understanding who is speaking, I as narrator will set each scene as to time and place, as well as identify the characters in the scene. So let's begin. Act one, scene one, finds Sidney and Roger Willoughby in their library, each seated in wing chair, reading a copy of Punch. Sidney speaks first. Up, Buck. Nonsense and twiddle twaddle. I'm canceling my subscription. What for? Listen to this. Here's a man who's as poor as a church mouse, but because people believe he's rich, he attains high position, amasses great wealth and wins the hand of a beautiful, well-born maiden. The appearance of wealth is power. I beg your pardon? Well, merely a fray, paraphrase of what you were saying. Of course, I agree. Ah, then we'll both cancel our subscriptions. No, I agree with the story. You don't. I do. Then you're a fool. Such things don't happen except in fairy tales. For argument's sake, take a man, a man who is poor and unknown, not a penny to spend, not a home, not a friend. But for argument's sake, you are willing to make him a loan, a rather large loan for argument's sake. Then he'd actually have the money, not the appearance of money. I've got it. Do you remember that the Bank of England once issued two notes of a million pounds each in anticipation of purchasing a small country for the empire? No. Well, it did. But after we bargained, only one was necessary. The other lies a virgin in the vault. I could buy it this afternoon. What for? Well, if for argument's sake we found such a man, we could lend him the note for a period of time to see what happens. I see. The form of the loan is a note. The note isn't his, it's a bank's. Not one halfpenny bit will the man get of it. But for argument's sake, he is willing to take it with thanks. He's lavish with thanks, for argument's sake. Thanks won't buy him breakfast or rent him a room. Ah, but think, man, think. Use your fertile imagination. He'll have several dazzling women. That, that sounds, sounds good, good but sir. sir. Why, it sounds good, but sir, I doubt it. He'll have caviar for breakfast. Which, of course, will make him ill. He'll have servants. He'll have horses. 
Wonderful. Have you been drinking? Many friends among the gentry. No, he won't. Yes, he will. He'll be in demand for dinner. He won't know which fork to eat with. Queen Victoria will greet him. Stop right there. You've gone too far. He'll have power. He'll be famous. I'm in luck. It's almost tea time. He'll become a knight at 30. I'm not listening. Yes, you are. For argument's sake, don't you see? A million pound note would change a man's life. I agree. I agree. We agree. He'll be someone people laugh at. You may say so, but I doubt it. He'll be begging bread for breakfast. He might do it for a thrill. Rabid dogs will chase him daily. Quite absurd. Have you been drinking? Then he'll come down with pneumonia. No, he won't. Oh, yes, he will. He'll be toothless in a fortnight. There's a logic that escapes me. He'll be starving even sooner. Stop right there. You've gone too far. In a week, he'll be arrested. I'm in luck. It's almost tea time. I suspect the judge will hang him. I'm not listening. Yes, you are. For argument's sake, he'll live. For argument's sake, he won't. You know for a fact you're wrong. As a matter of fact, I don't. Shall we bet? Shall we what? Shall we bet? Why not? 10,000 pounds. Done. Now, for the difficult part. Where will we find such a man? The streets of London are full of them. You merely have to cast out your net and pull one in. I'm leaving. You can't go out now. Why not? Good Lord, man, it's tea time. Pomfret, Pomfret. Scene two is a dock in the east end of London. A ship has just landed and been tied up. Henry Adams watches as a large cargo net is being lowered for many boxes, rugs, crates, etc., and dumped unceremoniously onto the pier. Henry is bearded, bare-chested, and wearing some torn sailor pants. Augie, a beggar, stands to the side, looking on. The captain calls from the ship. I see you survived the night, Mr. Adams. Suppose you want your belongings, eh? Say, if you want to debark by way of the gangplank, next time, buy yourself a ticket. Henry gestures angrily, but says nothing. He catches the beggar's eye, and they shrug in unison as if they understand one another. Henry is clearly discouraged and cold. He sits on one of the boxes, his head in hands. A bundle thrown above hits him on the back. Thanks. Should have let you drown. No, he's right. God knows I was willing to drown, and if I had, I, I wouldn't be here now. Miserable and cold without a penny to my name. <sighs> Say, you can't understand a word I'm saying, can you? <laughs> I forgot I'm in China, of all places. You sure don't look Chinese. I ain't. Well, good. That makes two of us. But well, where are you from? London. <laughs> Poor fellow. You're nearly as far from home as I am. Oh, why didn't I drown? Why didn't I drown? Why didn't you? Well, because some fool with a spyglass saw me and threw me a rope. I was so confused. I saved myself. Bad luck. Terrible luck. The story of my life. Can't even succeed in drowning myself. Augie points menacingly toward the water. Oh, it's, it's not something you do twice. No matter. I'll starve to death this time. I know, uh, don't know a soul in Shanghai. God knows Lloyd Hastings isn't selling curry and gould mine stock here. No, he's on his way to London or already there, curses bones. After I've done all the work evaluating the mine, he said I wasn't the kind of man to be partnered with him. He said I was unimaginative, uncommanding, and unlucky. Huh. And you know what? What? He was right. That's why 
there was nothing for me to do but to try to drown myself. I found a leaky boat, headed into the storm. Oh, why didn't I drown? Why? Hell, there's nothing for me to live for now. Augie leaves, pointing at Henry and making a crazy sign. Henry undoes his bundle and exchanges his clothes for those inside. A ragged shirt, vest, and jacket. He hears a dog barking in the distance. Something scoots very fast in front of him. He's unnerved and goes behind a box to finish dressing. Portia and Mrs. Worth appear, nets in hand. Absolute silence is required, my dear. I'm positive the poor creature is behind, is hiding behind yon box. Mrs. Worth casts her net and snares Henry. Help! Cover your eyes, dear child. We've mistaken a wretched half-naked man for a noble beast. She runs back to take a closer look. Aunt Millicent! Merely making certain my eyes are not what they were. Get, get, get me out of this. The fool will frighten off all the starving animals. Perhaps we should help the poor man. Don't pity him. But you said he was half wretched and half naked. Nonetheless, he's been blessed with hands, not paws. Therefore, he can quite easily fend for himself. Henry has extricated himself and thrown the net out. Mrs. Worth retrieves it. Come now, girl, none of your emancipated ideas about helping the common man. Leave that to your unfortunate friend, Jane. You're not still going to those meetings with her, are you, Portia? It would be extremely displeasing to your uncle and to me. Portia doesn't answer. Mrs. Worth throws her eyes heavenward. They leave. Henry emerges, red-faced, but dressed in his ragged outfit. He seats himself again on a box. Head in hands, Archie and Percy arrive. Here now, you, get off that box. Yes, you. Not ours after all. OK. Not ours after all. This one's ours. Well, I must say, it's a beat beat up. Suppose the vase is cracked. Not to worry. We, we've got a buyer. Thank God, who is it? He buys from Jack, and I sells to Tom, and we keeps a tidy profit. Life is sweet. When one cleverly makes ends meet, he haggles with Bob, I dicker with Bill, and we makes the better bargain. Brassware or brandy, anything handy, horse of another, I'll trade my mother. Entrepreneurs, higgling, niggling, no job nastier. I'd retire, but the wife who'd feed her, he starts a deal here, I close a sale there, and we keeps a tidy profit. Rubies or rifles, knick-knacking trifles, fish out of water, I'll sell your daughter, entrepreneurs. He buys a vase, I sells a vase, and we keeps a tidy profit. Life is grand, when one takes everything in hand. He overbids Ralph, I undersells George, and we makes the better bargain. Fruitcake and cherries, cage of canaries, wolf in sheep's panties, uncles and aunties, entrepreneurs, wheeling, dealing, not my cup of tea, I'd retire, but then 
who'd feed me? He skins our chap here, I bleeds our bloke there, and we keeps a tidy profit. Pearls and chinchilla, beans of vanilla, lapis lazuli, arms of yours truly, linen or leather, birds of a feather, prince of Wales kitten, we'll sell Great Britain. Hey, Prophet, I'm not satisfied with that kind of thing any longer. No, indeed, we need to make a killing. Wouldn't that be nice? Right. Well, let's get on with it. Hear you. Don't stand around looking useless. Pick up that box. No, the other one. There's a shilling in it for you. Percy and Chester and Archie Lee. Something tells me this isn't Shanghai. Blimey, you poor sod. Can't you read? He points to a sign that reads London. Great Scott! Some nights take an hour. Last night took a year, waiting with the moon for the sun, sitting on the sidewalk of an empty street. Now at last, the morning's begun. Ah, London, wake up, you've got a visitor. London, how did you treat a guest? Do you leave him alone? If he's lucky, he gets by. Or do you greet him and offer your best? London, wake up, there's someone new in town. Sorry, don't know how long he'll stay. He can't imagine what tomorrow will bring until he lives through the day. Scene three is at Portland Place, the private residence of the Willoughby Brothers. The Hog and Toad pub is nearby. A large tree is in the center of the square. Roger and Sydney are searching for a candidate. Looking behind lampposts while peering from the side of one's eyes at every passing vagrant has given me a migraine. It was your idea. The wager was my idea. The charade of finding our man by slinking down every street in London was yours. Never mind, we're home. I don't think locating our candidate is going to be easy. If it were easy, it wouldn't be fun. Well, I wouldn't th hadn't thought of that. We must be having a marvelous time. We are, dear brother, we are. Portia and Mrs. Worth are in the street. Oh, uh, Millicent, it's a dreadful day for a picnic. Look at the sky. It's exactly the kind of weather for falling in love. It looks rather like it's going to rain. My dear, it always looks like it's going to rain in London, but today it might actually storm, the sky turning deep, deep violet while lightning flashes all round, or the sun might suddenly fight its way through those clouds to reveal a flawless egg blue sky. Egg blue? Like the egg of a robin. But it might simply rain. Oh, I don't think so. No, I recognize this sort of weather. As you know, your uncle and I fell in love on just such a suspenseful day at the annual Mansfield Clam Bake. You never mentioned that before. No sooner had the sky turned purple than your uncle turned, looked into my eyes. And then? Have another clam, Millie, said your uncle in a low voice. Oh, if only that could happen to me. But Aunt Millicent, there's something I've got to tell you. I hope you won't be, dis I won't be disgraced to the family. Like her poor sex-craved mother, heaven forbid. When a man gets too close, too close is six feet, I get nervous. I don't like it. When a man gets too close, I hear my heart beat and my cheeks burn. I don't like it. 
when a man gets too close, I can't catch my breath. My knees shake, my mouth's dry. I'm scared half to death. That's it. That's why, good grief, it's not shameless lust. What a de relief. The next time I tremble, I'll know that I tremble with me a fear. The next time I'm fainting, I'll see that I'm fainting with sheer fear. And soon I will sit by the side of a man and hear all his breathtaking words. Relaxed though I'm still terrified of the man, I'm at ease with the bees, I'm at home with the birds. The next time I tremble, I know I will tremble with just mere fear. And the next time I choke up, I'll see I'm all choked up with sheer fear. And soon I will sit by the side of a man, relaxed though I'm still terrified of the man, and cool even when I perspire, because it is clear. It isn't desire. I'm sure it's purely fear. Her mother's child, dear God, this is terrible. I must find her husband at once. Excuse me, madam. You have something for a poor starving man. Oh, you startled me. Do I have something? Well, I might. I've a handkerchief. You wouldn't want that. I, and I have a lovely apple. Just the thing for a poor hungry man. Don't be shy. Take a bite. It will make me so happy just to see you enjoy it. The beggar takes a bite. He's obviously annoyed. He starts to speak, but Mrs. Worth cuts him off. Don't try to thank me. I'm certain you'll do a kind deed for someone someday. Anyway, your expression is thanks enough. He looks angry. I'm afraid you're a poor judge when it comes to appearances, dear. What he's looking is intense, and I would reckon it was intense gratitude he's feeling. But since he hasn't got the vocabulary to express himself, the feeling has stretched his features in a disagreeable way, which is, of course, entirely misleading. Oh. Now I'm off. There are animals requiring rescue all over London. Can't I come with you? No, my girl, you must go to the picnic. Some fine young man may see you and want to marry you within the week. There will be chaperones, I trust. Oh, yes, aunt. I'm sure of it. They leave with Augie looking at an apple with disgust. Not the vocabulary, eh? I'm too much of a gentleman to use it. Shouldn't have left it to her imagination when what I wanted was tuppence or thruppence or a whole dumb crown. Now, if I'd asked her point blank for some currency, would she have had the cheek to give me an apple? Huggy throws the apple in the cutter in the gutter and disappears. A dog barks ferociously. Get away! Let go of my leg. Roger and Sydney have been watching from their window. Well, Sidney, he was certainly a ragged specimen. Seemed intelligent in his way, not a bad sort. But I couldn't say, oh, there's the fellow. Nor could I. Why, I wonder. He wasn't desperate, was he? Threw away a perfectly good apple. You'd have to describe him as a man of means. Exactly. And his moral character was substandard. Wouldn't want a beggar. Never. Wouldn't fit the description. Which reminds me, would you mind reading that off once more? An intelligent but honest stranger adrift in London without a friend and with no money. I'd forgotten the part without a friend. That's the sort of person very difficult to find these days. Nearly everyone, no matter how unpleasant this demeanor, seems to have a friend. Never mind. There must be one who doesn't. That's all we need. One, not a dozen. 
We've only got one million pound note to give away. To lend, dear brother, to lend. Keep a sharp eye. Numerous strollers appear. This is worth stalking an animal among them. Henry Adams appears, sees the apple immediately and contrives to pick it up without being witnessed. He's about to succeed when other strollers appear and he pretends to be tying his shoe. When Scrunch, another beggar, walks up to him. Would you have threepence for a poor starving man, governor? Uh, sorry, haven't any money, English or American. An American without money? Must have been shipwrecked. Scrunch leaves just as Henry reaches for the apple. Sidney leans out the window and calls to him. Uh, uh, you there? Yes, you. Would you step inside for a moment, please? Henry regretfully eyes the apple, but complies with Sidney's request. He climbs the staircase to the second level. The Willoughby brothers are consuming tea cakes while Henry stands nearly fainting with hunger. Are we correct in believing you to be a penniless American? Uh, yes, sir. How did you get to London without any money? It's a long story. Oh, we're exceedingly fond of long stories. If told with humor, cleverness, and tension. I see. Well, I... Uh, Come from? Uh, San Francisco. Where you were employed as a... Uh, a mining, mining broker's clerk. And? One Saturday afternoon, I went for a sale. As was your custom? Oh, no. I had a terrible disappointment. More than that, a man who I thought was my friend stabbed me in the back. You want to hear about it? Absolutely not. And I wanted to uh, commune with nature. Go on. Well, I ventured too far, and I was carried out to the sea. There was Marvelous a terrible story. storm. There was a terrible Marvelous storm, story. and I was swept away into the water. It was dusk, and I nearly drowned. When as luck would have it, I was rescued by a sharp-eyed sailor on a small brig bound for Shanghai. Aha! Uh -huh. By way of London, as I discovered yesterday. It was a long and stormy voyage, and they made me work my packet passage as a common sailor. Shocking. Well, when I landed, all I had were the rags I worked in and the bag of clothes I nearly drowned in. And so, no money. Although, as luck would have it, I soon earned a shilling carrying a large box for some gentleman. Well, then you're not penniless. Well, that was the day before yesterday. The shilling fed and sheltered me for 24 hours. During the next 24, I went without food and shelter. A short while ago, I saw a luscious big apple, minus one bite in the gutter. My mouth watered for it. My stomach craved for it. My whole being begged for it. But every time I made a move to get it. Someone noticed you. I know. Let me see if I have this right. You're an intelligent but honest stranger, adrift in London without a friend and with no money. And nothing in my stomach. Then I have something for you. He approaches Henry with a crumpet in hand, then reaches into his pocket for an envelope, which he gives to Henry. You'll find an explanation inside. No, not here. Take it outside. Look it over carefully. Don't be hasty or rash. But... Good day, sir. Good day, sir. You'll starve to death, poor wretch. Oh, I think not. We'll see in 30 days. Would you care to increase the wager by 600 pounds and a set of inlaid mother-of-pearl croquet mallets? Done. Now off to Scotland. I'm going to Liverpool. Liverpool? Henry has returned to the street, just as Scrunge picks up the apple. Nearly fainting, Henry sits down and opens the envelope and peeks inside. 
<laughs> money. Oh, damn. Hurrah. Now I can buy food. Food. He drags, he drags food. Himself, he drags himself to the hog and toad, and he attempts to brush off before he enters. As he enters, there's a great crash of thunder. Portia and Jane suddenly appear. I am so glad you came to the meeting. Wasn't it inspiring? Oh, yes. Uncle hates the Fabians, but I think they're absolutely right. The rich are too rich. And the poor, too poor. But whatever can I do to help? I don't have any influence or power. Don't worry about that now. Just come Saturday and you, you'll find the speaker most interesting. <gasps> Uncle's planned a tennis party. Well, why would you come this once? You used to love to play. Oh, I haven't time for that sort of thing anymore. Dear friend, but do try to escape, if only for an hour. You'll find me is more invigorating than hitting a ball across a net. Portia and Jane embrace and rush off. Portia into her house, Jane down the street. Mrs. Worth appears. I represent two habitats. One is for dogs and one's for cats. Each day at dawn, I'm on the prowl, listening for any hiss or growl. I am relentless, on the go, my trusty net held low. Monday, I saw a dog, then poof, it disappeared. I'll find him, woof, woof. Tuesday, I caught a pup, then ow. It nipped me, ran away, bow wow. I am relentless on the go, my trusty net held low. At noon, I heard a hiss, and now a pussycat still at large, meow. I found a pooch that was a scarf, a fuzzy fluff. Ha ha, arf, arf. I am relentless on the go. My trusty net held low, low, low. Hearing barking off stage, Mrs. Worth perks up. Augie runs, nearly knocking her down. She picks up her net and races off in the direction of the barking. Scene four is a London street Archie and Percy are waiting for Lloyd, Hastings, and Chester. What does Chester think of Hastings? Yes, he seems honest, but that's no guarantee. We seem honest, so I've been told. Well, there's nothing wrong in making a fair profit. And the ambassador will get as much pleasure in owning that vase as if it were the real thing from the Ming Dynasty. You, you cheeky bastard. Now, where's this Lloyd Hastings from? California. Where's that? Australia, I think. Primitive country, that sounds risky. Lloyd Hastings and Chester appear. Gentlemen, may I have the pleasure of introducing Lloyd Hastings, a man with an interesting proposition concerning a very large gold mine. <laughs> it doesn't belong to me, you understand. I'm the broker, that, that's all. The, the agent. But there's no question, gentlemen, that the Curry and Gould gold mine is the finest opportunity around. I can guarantee you that everyone in London will be talking about your astuteness, your clairvoyance, as it were, when no one else could see the value. No one else? Sounds risky. Sight unseen. Of course, it's our business to take chances. Once, maybe twice in your life, comes the chance to make a killing, a fortune, a hit. Once, if you're lucky, you know in advance, well, I'm telling you, this is it. A gold mine, a gold mine. The thing is a gold mine. Think of it, gentlemen, 
a grotto of gold. <laughs> a wonder, a wonder, a bright world down under. Picture it, gentlemen. You gotta be sold. Would I waste my breath and your time if what I'm saying's not, uh, not true? Do I look like the kind of man who tries such a trick on you? Once, maybe twice in your life, comes the chance to fill your pocket, your wallet, your bank. Once, if you're lucky, you know in advance. Well, you do. And I'm the one you can thank. A gold mine, a gold mine. Invest in my gold mine. You'll have, dear gentlemen, a pot full of gold. A wonder, a wonder, a bright world down under. Picture it, gentlemen and tell me you're sold. Sounds interesting, but we usually buy tangibles and resell at a minimum profit of 600%. <laughs> Actually, there are others who are interested, but I wanted your company to have the first option to buy because of your excellent reputation. Well, kindly leave your prospectus. You'll have our answer Wednesday morning at 10. Please. At 10. Scene five is the Hog and Toad, a pub. Kitty and Mrs. Barlow are there. Henry is seated alone at a table, several empty platters in front of him. He's finishing a beaker of ale, leaning back in his chair. Another pie, please. A gentleman wants another kidney pie. How many has he had? Five. God, chic. He hasn't enough to pay for it. You can be sure of that. Just look at him. And I haven't enough kitchen work to equal six pies. Never mind. I'll attend to this. Excuse me, sir. But could we please settle the bill? But, but I'm still hungry. I'll be happy to oblige you if you'll just pay up this check. Hmm, well, why must I pay before I'm finished? A custom, sir. After a person has consumed five of anything, uh, five ales, five puddings, four pies. I see. A mild eccentricity, perhaps. It keeps things tidy in the mind. Here's your bill. Oh, AJ, you can't pay it. It's rather high. Into the kitchen with you, then. There are dishes to be washed and a, a floor to be scoured. Henry removes the envelope from his pocket and pulls out the banknote. He does a triple take. It's clearly dumbfounded but quickly pulls himself together. <clears throat> but not too high. Uh, could you give me a change, please? This is Barlow, is able to move, breathe, or speak. Her eyes are on the note. Kitty comes to look. They both continue to gape. Finally. Ooh, how beautiful. Such a lovely round number. I'm sorry to inconvenience you, but that's all I've got. Uh, won't you please change it? I, I, I haven't anything else. Oh, I'm the one who's sorry, sir. Sorry not to be able to oblige you with the proper change. I haven't got 900,999 pounds, three crowns, one shilling, five pence on the premises. It's been a slow day. No, oh, golly. Well, we'll let it stand till another time. It's only a trifle. Uh, but possibly. I, I won't be in this neighborhood again for a good while. Oh, that's of no consequence, sir. I can wait and wait and wait. Besides, you can be sure that a gentleman such as yourself, sir, can have Anything you want at any time you choose. Uh, I, 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 I can? Of course, sir. Let the account run as long as you please. 
I hope I'm not afraid to trust a, a gentleman as rich as yourself, sir. A gentleman with such a, a, a highly developed sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Oh, playing locks on the public, dressing up like a tramp. Such a <clears throat> merry millionaire. Not many of your sort around. Well, I enjoy a good laugh, same as the next party. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, Kitty, where is this gentleman's kidney pie? Never mind. Never mind. I can't pay it. So please accept my IOU. And more steam pudding. She pours Henry some ale in a fit of frantic servitude as Henry writes on a napkin. My IOU, madam. Oh, I trust you, sir. And I know you'll come back, sir. But what if a tree falls on me? Here, please take it. The name's Adams, Henry Adams. Henry inches his way to the door while Mrs. Barlow talks. She doesn't see him leave. Yes, you'll be back because Make no mistake, there's no place like the Augur Dude. You'll love it. You can't help but love it. Comfortable people in comfortable chairs. You are welcome. You know you are welcome the minute you walk up the stairs. This is the place for feeling cozy, doing exactly as you please. This is the place for feeling oh so friendly. Touching elbows, touching knees. We'll treat you. We can't help but treat you. Comfortable problems with comfortable cures. You're welcome. You know you are welcome. The sentiment grows and endures. It's such a lovely nook. Glad you had a look. And when you come back, it will be all yours. And your friend, sir, you must invite your friends to the Og and Toad. They'll love it. They can't help but love it. Comfortable people, chock full of good cheer. They're welcome. They'll know they are welcome the minute. Hi ho, they are here. This is the place for eating puddings, cream chip beef, and kidney pie. And this is the place for feeling oh so friendly. And to and and by to fly. They'll love it. They can't help but love it. Comfortable people in comfortable chairs. They're welcome. They'll know they are welcome the minute they walk up the <clears> stairs. <throat> oh, it's such a homey nest. Nobody's a guest. And when your friends come, it will be all theirs. Henry is at the Willoughby house. He knocks. Pomfret answers the door. Uh, mm. Do you remember me? Indeed I do, sir. Well, please tell your employers that I'm here and I to set their minds at ease. I know they've made a terrible mistake. They're gone. Gone? Where? The continent, I think. Well, when will they be back? They said in a month. Oh, this is, this is awful. Please give me some sort of idea how to get word to them. It's extremely important. Can, sir. Sorry. I have no idea where they are. Oh, an immense mistake has been made. Will you tell them I've been here and that I'll keep coming back till it's all right? They said you'd be here in an hour to make inquiries, but that I was to tell you not to worry, as it says in the letter. They'll be here on time and expect you. Now, if you'll excuse me, sir. Pomfret closes the door. Henry sits down, takes out an envelope, the note, and digging deeper, the letter, which he reads. Ah. You are an intelligent and honest man. We conceive you to be a poor, poor and a stranger. Enclosed, you will find a sum of money. 
It is lent to you for 30 days without interest. Report at this house at the end of that time. I have a bet. If I win it, you shall have any situation that it is in my power to give you. Any that is that you are able to provide to prove yourself familiar with and competent to fill. No signature. Henry walks back and forth, mulling it over. Are they trying to help me or hurt me? Or neither? What if I take the note to the bank of England and have it placed to the credit of whomever it belongs? The bank will know whose it is. Well, then they'll ask me how I came into possession of it. And, and if I tell them the truth, I'll, I'll be put in the asylum. And, and if I lie, I'll be put in jail. What if I deposit the note to my account or borrow on it? No, that won't work either. Damn. I've got to carry this immense burden around until those men come back. Knowing it's useless to me, as useless as a handful of ashes. Yet, I must take care of it, watch over it, while I beg my living, so that I can help whomever it is win his bet and get that situation I've been promised. Oh, I should like to get that. Men of their sort have situations in their power that are worth having. Maybe it's not such bad luck after all. I'll start over again in London. Once there was a road to my future, and it was clear as a bell. Prospects were so promising, starting to gel. It all blew up in a minute. Sad, but it's true. Now I'm beginning again. But what should I do? Since I am desperate and destitute, it's plain to see I must believe in somebody. Somebody is me. Question I need to address. Can I then, nevertheless, become a raging success? Yes, yes, could be. Henry sits down to reread the letter and stares at the banknote. Meanwhile, back at the hog and toad, we see Mrs. Barlow and Kitty. No one ever forgets the hog and toad. It's been so since my grandmother's day. It is her recipe for kidney pie that we use to this very day. Kitty enters carrying a tray full of pies and puddings. Where is he? Go on, you bonehead. Just gone. A gentleman like that doesn't wait for pie. But that's all right. He said he'd be back and at least we'll have an important clientele. One millionaire and a loony one at that. Oh, Kitty, a millionaire doesn't have to live like a solitary flower among weeds. No, he's one of a bunch, a glorious bunch. Before you know it, the entire garden of the aristocracy will be here at the organ toad. Demanding more kidney pie, more ale, more steam pudding. A oh, glorious day with a wind like that outside. There's a terrific crash. Kitty and Mrs. Barlow look out of the window. Oh, God! The chestnut trees down in Portland Palace! A oh, good omen, Kitty. That tree blocked the sun. Scene six is the interior of St. George's tailor shop for the gentry. Todd, the clerk, is folding merchandise. St. George emerges from the dressing room carrying a pair of trousers. He is altering for Ambassador Worth. This won't take long, Mr. Ambassador. Please make yourself comfortable. Yeah, I must be home in time for tea. Mrs. Worth is particular about that. The well, door opens. Henry enters, or rather shoots in as if blown from a cannon. The wind is fierce. Well, dear me. See what the beggar wants. Tend to you presently. Todd takes the suits back into the dressing room. Now you see, I, I, I wasn't planning to come in. Um, I'm not in the market for a suit at this time, but 
when that tree fell, I, I thought I'd best find a safe place. I suppose you want one of our markdowns. Well, actually, I wanted uh, something uh, cheaper. There is one suit, much reduced, a floor sample two years ago. Quite out of style, but I don't imagine that's any consequence to you. He fishes it out of a pile and puts the jacket on Henry. Oh, a perfect fit. <clears throat> I believe it's too big. I, I, I prefer this one. A quality suit, sir? Uh, how much is it? Five pounds, four shillings, tuppence. Well, I'll take it. He rummages in his pockets while Todd sneers. It'll be an accommodation to me uh, if you could uh, wait some day, some days for the money. I haven't any small change. Well, I'd only expect such a gentleman as yourself to carry around large change. Well, I'm quite able to pay for this suit. I, I simply didn't want to put you to the trouble of changing such a large note. We can change any note you might towards the note. He gives an eloquent whistle and then tears the jacket off Henry's shoulders. He is in a fit. Todd, you're a fool, a born fool, driving every millionaire from this place because you can't tell one from a tramp and never could. Ah, here's the very thing I'm after. Have a look, sir. It's just the thing, the very thing. Plain, rich, tasteful, and uh, just ducally knobby. <laughs> Made. To or can we? There. Hmm. Mm, not quite right. In fact, terrible. It's perfect. Won't do. Wait till you see what we'll get up for you on your own measure. Come, Todd. Book and pen. Get at it. <clears throat> Length of leg? 32. I saw you, sir, when you came in, so well disguised from toe to chin. So grimly destitute in the shabby old rags of that shabby old suit. But I wasn't fooled a minute, sir, about the sort of man you were. You see, the breeding shows in the upper-class shape of your upper-class nose. <laughs> Such a gentleman requires a modest but effective wardrobe. A man of your position must have morning coats and flannels, 14 shirts with matching panels, <laughs> seven mufflers trimmed with mink. A man of your position must have 13 suits for dining. Five should have a satin lining, two in green and three in pink. But my dear sir, I can't make this order un unless you can wait indefinitely or, or change this bill. <laughs> indefinitely, <laughs> it's a weak word, sir, a weak word, eternally. <clears throat> That's the word, sir. Jackets, 11, dressing gowns, nine, embroidered initials, yours on the pocket and on the inside neck. It's the privilege and the pleasure, sir. God knows they are the treasure, sir. When I take the measure of a man so fine, so rich. As the song ends, Henry, still wearing his ragged suit, becomes part of a musical scene. He dances from store to store where, after exhibiting the note, he is supplied with everything a gentleman could desire. An elegant, furnished apartment, an umbrella, a hat, boots, a pocket watch, a wallet, 
A barber shaves off his beard and trims his hair. He's given a manicure. When he returns to the tailor shop, a new suit is ready. He goes behind a screen and reappears. The picture of a young millionaire. Millionaire. Ambassador Worth enters without benefit of trousers. God damn it, St. George, where are my pants? Oh, sir, right away, sir. Todd, you idiot, where are the ambassador's pants? Go get them at once. Todd leaves. I, I couldn't help overhearing your conversation. I also am an American. Allow me to introduce myself, Cleveland Worth, ambassador to the court of St. James. How do you do, sir? Henry Adams. Uh, of course. Adams, your family, need I mention, is well known. I myself have family in Massachusetts, but not so famous as yours. This gentleman is descended from two presidents, John and John Quincy, as well as being distantly related to Maud, the actress, Roger the chemist, and Charles the humorous poet. I'm surprised I wasn't informed of your arrival in London. Lucky I ran into you. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, where are you staying? One, Edward Street. Then we're almost neighbors. That's very near the embassy. Uh, Mr. Adams, a bit informal of me, I know, but Mrs. Worth and I are giving a small dinner party next week in honor of Lloyd Hastings, a mining expert from California. Have you heard of him? Oh, we've met. I'm not surprised. A man with your background has probably met everyone. Well, at last, here are my trousers. And here, here's my card. We'll expect you next Wednesday at 8.30. Henry bows to the ambassador. St. George and Todd bow to Henry. The door opens, which lets in both a blow of the wind and Portia, who runs in head lowered and runs into Henry. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, miss. Marcia! I've been looking everywhere for you. Aunt Millicent says it's time for tea. Uh, Mr. Adams, may I present my niece, Portia Langham. Miss Langham. You shouldn't be out in this weather. But I like it. I don't want you walking about alone with trees are falling all over the place. Mr. Adams, would you be so kind? Aunt Millicent won't like it. <laughs> She'll approve of Mr. Adams, my dear. Not only is he a millionaire, but he's one of the Massachusetts Adams. <gasps> he's awfully young to be too rich. Uh, promise to remember this. As long as you live, no one is ever too rich. But there are people who are too poor. And that's because of the people who are too rich. Jane says so. And that woman is a menace and a traitor to her class. She and her kind, the Fabians, want to level us all out like a field of potatoes. There's more to economics than they think. I'll wager if they have their way, it'll be the end of your empire. My empire? <laughs> I'm an American, so it certainly isn't mine. Tell your aunt I'll be home directly and, and invite Mr. Adams to tea. Invite him to the tennis party. Invite him somewhere. It's not proper. Did you bring your racket to London, Mr. Adams? Uh, why no? That's not a problem. We have extras. Please join us on Saturday. We'll see you get a decent match. Portia and Henry walk out together. Henry holds his new umbrella over her head. Scene seven is a street in Glasgow. The brothers Willoughby are out for a stroll. I should have gone to Liverpool. What in heaven's name would you have done there? Nothing. Then why? I would have enjoyed knowing that there was no one in town worth knowing and nothing in town worth doing. If I may say so, you're showing signs of becoming eccentric. I wonder what's happened to our man. You're changing the subject. 
But to answer your question, I think he's probably still alive, but very weak, lying in a gutter somewhere without the nerve to exhibit the note for fear of arrest. What do you mean? How would such a beggarly person happen to possess such a note unless he stole it? I never thought of that. Oh, come now, dear brother. Never mind about him. Let's enjoy ourselves. Take a deep The air in Scotland is invigorating, and so, I remember, are the girls. Someday I'll travel a road without signs, finding old relics and drinking new wines, climbing a mountain or two or three, seeing the world in its greenery. I'll go along if there's scenery. Girls, girls, girls. Someday I'll settle in history's lap, studying Europe with museum and map. Pacing each palace of king and czar, translating marks on an ancient jar. I'll go along for the objet d'art, girls, girls, girls. Someday I'll journey down life's mystic path, wash off the world in a ritual bath, open my third eye and meditate, lost in a vision of heaven's gate. I'll come along and hallucinate, Girls, girls, girls. Someday I'll ship out and sail with the breeze, claiming small islands on unexplored seas, right of adventures near Cape Good Hope, mail in a bottle green envelope. I'll watch from home with a telescope. Girls, girls, girls. Scene eight finds us at Portland Place, the Worth residence. Worth residence where we find Mrs. Worth and Portia. Aren't you ever going to leave Henry and me to ourselves? How can I, my dear? Of course I trust you implicitly, but Henry, after all, is a man. I'm sorry, but he's just the one you can trust. He's never said or tries anything. In fact, I've quite decided I'm not one bit afraid of him. I've discovered I can get rather close to him and not really mine. Explain that. I feel extremely nervous when we're together, but in an instinctively comfortable sort of way, which is a vast improvement over feeling nervous in an uncomfortable way. Do you understand? I hope not. It sounds ominous. Oh, I care about Henry, but the only way he'll ever find out is if I tell him so myself. He's strangely backward, and that's probably why I'm not afraid of him. What if he's not normal? Even so, you must become engaged at once. Time is running out. I can feel the sand in my shoes. Oh, he'll never propose. You can count on that. We only talk about weather, theater, and tennis. And you know, you're always there. I'll give you five minutes all by yourselves in the parlor before we go on our picnic. Right now? Mrs. Worth exits. It's too soon. I'm not ready. I, I don't know what I'm going to do or what I'm going to say. Henry enters. It, it, it's you! Oh, dear! Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, shall I wait outside? Oh, don't be silly. Uh, what's wrong with you anyway? Uh, don't you realize we haven't been alone together since the first afternoon you walked me home? Henry Gapes. And, and we don't have much time now. Aunt's coming right back. Henry sits down on a love seat and continues to gape. Portia is exasperated and desperate. You know, I, uh, 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 I got up at dawn as usual. I started my day as usual, uh, doing the things I usually do. Nothing of importance, just an ordinary day. Suddenly, you came and took my breath away. Standing apart as usual, uh, trying to act as usual, feeling what I don't usually feel, Everything's the same, and yet it's not. Uh, uh, something's happening, but I don't know what. On the other hand, perhaps I do. 
what's happening to me today is you. Portia sits down next to Henry and leans over 75% of the way. Finally, Henry gets the idea and kisses her. They pop apart as if burned, then kiss again and again. Then standing up, they dance and sing. Got up at dawn as usual. Started my day as usual, doing the things I usually do. Nothing of importance, but an ordinary day. Suddenly you came and took my breath away. Standing apart as usual, trying to act as usual, feeling what I don't usually feel. Everything was the same, and yet it's not. Something's happening, but I don't know what. On the other hand, perhaps I do. What's happening to me today is you. This is Worth enters and finds them kissing. Disgustingly normal. Can't let them can't can't let them out of my sight. She diplomatically Portia. retreats and calls from the next room. Portia, Portia. Portia and Henry leave. Scene nine finds us at the Hog and Toad, now refurbished. Mrs. Barlow and Kitty are proud and delighted as the pub is overflowing with people. One chair and table remains empty as Kitty sings. Kitty, are you on? It appears she's been knocked off the air. No, I'm here. Oh, you're there. Page oh, 48. Oh, I see. Want to go back to something? I'll lead, I'll lead in from the top of 48. And Scene she... 9, the hog and toad, now refurbished. Mrs. Barlow and Kitty are proud and delighted as the pub is overflowing with people. One chair and table remains empty as Kitty sings. I seen him, I met him, well, I know all about him. He smiled at me, and he spoke to me. I can't do without him. He's truly a noble man, someone to look up to. Trustworthy and high-minded, whom I wanted to The best pocket millionaire, Henry Adams, escorted Miss Portia Langham to a performance by the Royal Ballet. 
They were accompanied by Lord and Lady Wyndham. Mr. Adams will spend the weekend, etc. It isn't the weekend yet, you know. I expect him, same as always. While he'll sit in that very chair at that very table, same as always. He'll order kidney pie and ale, same as always. And when he's all finished, he'll pull out that beautiful million pound note for me to feast me eyes on. And then he'll ask for change. Same as always. I've seen the note seven times, but even if I see it a hundred, I want to see it some more. That's right and proper. Me too. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. And it is beautiful. Nothing to top it. All those zeros. Inspiring. Awesome. Artistic. And the loveliest part of it for me is that when I stand next to that chap who owns a million pound note, I feel sort of uh, almost rich myself. Exactly. <clears throat> I wonder if he enjoys the money as much as we do. Kitty marches out where she collides with Henry. What did I tell you? Here he is. God bless his soul. And his money. Isn't he handsome? Your picture don't do you justice, your highness. But my cooking will. Have a chair, sir. Your pie is waiting. Kitty has placed a large pie and ale at the empty table. Eat it while it's hot. Thought. Oh, I can't wait. Sometimes he has two, even three pies. And I guess match him pie for pie. Mr. Adams has a healthy appetite, praise God. Now, each pie costs less than a penny and, and each pie sells for three penny six. After deducting all the expenses means I earn 200% on each bite. And so, since we all know millionaires never have any ready cash, I stuff Mr. Adams' pockets with something negotiable every time he comes in. The man is good for my business. Why shouldn't my business be good for the man? All of London, all of London listens to my every word. All of London considers me a financial wizard. If I told people here to buy shares in a piece of the Atlantic Ocean, they'd not only do it, but when they lost every nickel, <laughs> would they blame me? No, sir. The rich can do no wrong. But, oh God, <clears throat> if they ever find out I'm not who they think I am, they'll draw a quarter and boil me. Only a few more days and I'll have my job and be able to pay everyone back. Henry finishes his pie, stands up, and exhibits the million pound note. Yo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Uh, mind I have change, please? Mrs. Barlow and Kitty eyeball the note, making exaggerating facial expressions and even pretending to faint. Please believe me. Unless my eyes deceive me, what I'm seeing is a phenomenon. Dear oh dear oh, zero after zero, many zeros starting with a one. Oh 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 then, oh oh oh, oh what a splendid sight. Oh 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 oh, oh oh oh, I'm swooning with delight. Someone stop her, put a lid on top of her. With no warning, she has gone insane. Dear oh dear oh, zero after zero. Look, those zeros sabotage her brain. Oh, 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 then, oh, 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 there's something to behold. Oh, 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 oh. worth pockets, pots of gold. 
What I'm eyeing is electrifying. I'm full of wonder. I'm in ecstasy. Dear, oh dear, oh, zero after zero. Somehow they have made a superstar of me. Oh, 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 then, oh, 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 I may perform a waltz. <laughs> oh, 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 or turn some somersaults. Oh, 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 then, oh, 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 I'm dancing a gavotte. Oh, 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 oh. I may explode. So what? When people love you for your money or your looks, it isn't an emotion that's going to last a lifetime. Henry walks from the pub to the ambassador's estate where he picks up a tennis rack. He pantomimes with a racket showing his pathetic lack of technique. He's very awkward. Oh, doomed. I'll never get through the day without Portia knowing what a liar I am. I don't know how I can tell her, but somehow now I must tell her the truth. So much to lose if I tell her, but how can I choose not to tell her the truth? Maybe she'll understand it, pretending I'm someone I'm not. How could she understand it? If so, she would love me forever, no matter what. I don't know how I can tell her, but somehow now, I must tell her, isn't it strange? My whole life will change with a few words. What will she say? Hello and stay. Goodbye and go. Thank God I'll know. After I tell her the truth today. Portia enters. Henry, I've something important to ask you. Would you? terribly disappointed if we didn't play tennis today. No, 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 I guess not. Oh, I'm so glad because I want to go to a meeting with my friend Jane. She told me about it. It's much more worthwhile than tennis. Also, there's something I have to tell you, something you don't know about me. What? I hate tennis. Uh, will you come with me to the meeting? Will you marry me? <laughs> Don't answer that. First, I have something very important to tell you. Uh, I have no money. Just a million pound note? No, it's, it's, it's not mine. It's not mine. You stole it? Uh, no. The note was lent to me, but not because I asked to borrow it. He takes out the letter. Here, read this. Portia reads the letter. Now you know everything, except that I am or was a mining clerk in San Francisco, USA. I'd still be there, but I was shipwrecked and then rescued by a brig on the way to China by way of London. I expect to be offered a decent job when the 30 days are up so that I can pay off all of my debts and support you, if you can forgive me. For what? For not being who you thought I was. 
Oh, then I accept your proposal. <laughs> so, so you'll marry me? Portia nods. A man with nothing. A man who lied to you, to everyone. A man who can't even play tennis. Now I know some things undisclosed before, and yet what I heard made me love you more. Who I thought you were, who someday you'll be, matters not at all. You're the world to me. Stories one and two couldn't both be true till I found out today you were always you. Portia takes his racket and throws it into the bushes, then takes his arm and they walk away. End of act. Act two, scene one. Outside a London office where Archie is talking with Chester and Percy. He's a sort of fellow. Rumor has it he made his money profiteering in rum. No, his millions were inherited. His family owns Massachusetts and a large percentage of mine. No one ever heard of him before last week, and here he is caricatured in Punch. Let me see. The vest pocket millionaire. Why is he called that? He keeps a million pound note in his vest pocket. Ostentatious bloke. Well, he's an American. They're like children, aren't they? I wonder if our friend Hastings is acquainted with Mr. Adams. Doubtful. Why so? Men like Hastings would have mentioned it. Unless he had tried to sell his mine stock to Mr. Adams and was turned down. When Hastings arrives, we'll show him the article and ask straight off if he knows Henry Adams. Ambassador Worth and Lloyd Hastings meet by accident outside the London office building. Ah, Mr. Hastings, what a happy coincidence. Mrs. Worth and I are looking forward to your company tonight at dinner. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. A old friend of yours will be with us. Who's that? Henry Adams. Who? You don't, you don't mean to say you've forgotten meeting so renowned a figure as Henry Oh, I get it. You're pulling my leg. I've been in England so long, I've lost my Yankee sense of humor. Very amusing. <laughs> Who is Henry Adams indeed? <laughs> the Henry only one I know is sitting at his, at his desk in San Francisco, dreaming of becoming a clerk. There you are, Hastings. Come in. Come in, we've been waiting for you. There's something of the greatest importance we have to ask you. Yes? You know Henry Adams? Know him? My dear sir, I'm having dinner with him tonight. Excellent. With his name behind you, Hastings, you'll find us somewhat more interested in your mind stock. But without his name? An hypothetical situation, surely, if he's a friend of yours, and the mine is as valuable as your client. Till tomorrow, then. Oh, by the way, Hastings, you'll be interested in the addition of Punch. There's a drawing of your friend, Mr. Adams, on page 12. Percy hands the magazine to Lloyd, who walks outside and is reading the article. Of the vest pocket millionaire? Oh, where in the hell could I have met him? What am I going to say? Nice to see you again. Would you be so kind as to let me use your name to sell my stock? Augie appears and approaches Lloyd for a handout. Good evening. Get away. No money. Empties his pockets. He then rings a bell at the Worth residence. The door is opened and a voice from within announces him, as others will continue to be announced. Mr. Lloyd Hastings. As more couples arrive, they are approached by Augie and give him some change or bills. The Duke and Duchess of Shoreditch, Lady Anne, Grace, Eleanor, Celeste, Mary Louise de Bohun, the Earl and Countess of Newgate. 
Henry arrives, trailed by Elsie. Yes, the peak, sir. I'd be so grateful seeing him as I miss going to the organ dole today. Henry good-naturedly pulls out the note and hands it to Elsie, whereupon Mrs. Barlow enters. Oh, I thought as much. Leave the gentleman alone. I'll take that, miss. Here you are, sir, and here's a little something on the side. Mind you, keep them separate. Come along, you wicked girl. Henry puts one bill in his vest pocket, the other in his pants pocket. The lighting is dim. Augie approaches and holds out his hand. Don't I know you? Don't think so, sir. Well, here you go. He pulls out a bill from his pocket and puts it in Augie's hand. Mr. Henry Adams. Two other couples enter, give money to Augie and ring the bell. Lord and Lady Blatherskite. Viscount and Countess Bliss. Henry is alone in the foyer. The ambassador comes to greet him. Ah, young man, I understand you went with my niece to a meeting of the Fabians last week. Oh, yes, sir. It was most interesting. Mm, sorry to hear that. But not convincing. <laughs> Glad to hear that. I hope you expressed your opinion to Portia. I did, sir. Good, good. She's young and impressionable, but thank God, only a woman. So it hardly matters what she thinks. In fact, it's rather refreshing to find a girl of her background so unconcerned about a man's wealth. <laughs> yes. She's not after your money is what I mean. Oh, no, sir. And I, I think she likes you. Do you approve? I do. Not to mention Mrs. Worth, who is most favorably impressed. Well then, sir, if I proposed to your niece and I weren't a millionaire or even a person of a steady job, would you... Uh, uh... Fortune hunters must have made you weary. One wants to be appreciated for oneself. Well, I can set your mind at ease, Mr. Adams, because you see, I like you and it has nothing to do with the importance of your family or the fortune you possess. No, it's just a feeling I have, almost a sixth sense. I look at you and I think, what a swell fellow. Gee, thanks. And so if you happen to have fallen for my niece, Mr. Adams, don't waste a precious moment. You have my permission to propose. Oh, thank you, sir. The ambassador exits as Portia enters. He winks at Henry. Lloyd Hastings here, Henry. He's terrifically nervous. Uh, what are you going to do if he recognizes you? I haven't decided. I've been too busy thinking about ways to get even with him. Oh, that doesn't sound like you, Henry. You're the only woman alive who knows her man's worst qualities before she marries him. Henry kisses Portia. I have some good news. Your uncle gave me permission to propose. He said I didn't have to be rich. Oh, you told him. That's wonderful. Henry tries to explain, but Portia throws her arms around his neck and kisses him. The ambassador, Mrs. Worth, and the others, not including Lloyd Hastings, walk in. Ladies, lords, and gentlemen, I'm honored to announce the engagement of our beloved niece, Portia Langham, to our esteemed friend, Mr. Henry Adams. In the nick of time. My dear boy, now that you're almost a member of the family, could I ask a favor of you? Oh, anything. Uh, could I hold the million pound note? Henry reaches into his vest pocket for the note. He pulls out a bill and is about to give it to the ambassador when he realizes it's not the million pound note. He looks in all his pockets. He practically strips himself behind the Ming vase, but the note isn't there. Mrs. Worth peeks at him behind the vase. Lovely man. What I can see of him. It's, 
<laughs> it's gone. Oh, it's, it's probably in another vest. No, no, because this very evening I, I took it out to show a friend and then, oh God, I gave it to the beggar. You had me going there for a moment. I actually believed you. I haven't enjoyed myself so much since I left the States. A millionaire and a practical joker all rolled into one. What a wonder. Lloyd Hastings enters. I'll wager you two haven't talked to one another this evening. If you'll excuse us. He and Mrs. Worth leave. <laughs> it's so, so nice to see you again, Mr. Adams. A privilege, sir. Ah, yes, Hastings. You haven't changed. Uh, nor you, sir. Henry is satisfied that Lloyd has no idea who he is. Henry, uh, you were joking about the note, weren't you? Um, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Portia leaves. I have a proposition, Mr. Adams, that I believe would interest you. As a, a, a... My good man, this is hardly the moment. I've just become engaged. And what's more, this is not a business occasion. Please forgive me, sir. I thought as a fellow American... Yes. A, and old acquaintances... <laughs> the odd thing is that the more I look at you, sir, the less I think you're the man I thought you were. You must remember our meeting. When? Uh, it is hard to put a date on it. Well, where then? Difficult to say. Are you related by any chance to the Adamses of San Francisco? I don't know a soul west of uh, Chicago. That's it. Chicago. 1891? I was there. Well, I wasn't. No matter. You have a matter of the greatest importance to discuss with me. I'll give you a quarter of an hour, starting at 10 o'clock precisely. Here's my card. Don't be late. Thank you. God bless you, sir. I'll be there. Lloyd leaves as Ambassador and Mrs. Worth and Portia return. Oh, Henry, I thought you said you told my uncle the truth. Mm. I'm greatly disappointed, Mr. Adams. Naturally, this, this changes everything. A mining clerk with no family and not a penny to his name. But such a lovely man, kind to animals, and Portia loves him. I'm sure he's going to be given a wonderful position. Say something, Henry. Make Uncle understand. A little late for that. In fact, it's probably my duty to let the country know it's been hoodwinked. However, if you promise not to bother Porsche again, young man, then I won't say a word. Anyway, I should have known you weren't really an Adams. You haven't got the right accent. Goodbye. Henry! Henry and Portia look at one another in anguish as Henry exits. It's only then that he is reminded that not only has, has he lost Portia, but the million dollar pound, the million pound note. He looks for the beggar who is now in another part of town and lighting a match to look at the million pound note which he gapes at in disbelief. A million pound note. A million pound note. A million pound note. I'm rich, I'm rich. Now I'll take me rightful place in the world. I can see it all. Beautiful women, more food than I can eat. A comfortable bed, that's the life. Not a dog in sight and enough gin to last a week. Augie gets up and goes to the pub where he meets Jack. Get him out. I can pay. Out! No beggars or animals allowed. I got enough money to buy and sell off of London. Here, have a look. Looks real, don't it? He passes hey. it around. But it ain't. It's a fake. 
Like the man who's holding it. I swear. You have a mind to go to jail, have ya? Augie leaves while bystanders jeer at him. In a sequence reminiscent of Henry's musical scene, when he was outfitted and honored because of the note, Augie goes to the place and is thrown out, out on his ear each time. Finally, he's chased by bobbies and people shouting, thief. He escapes and is alone on the street. I'd have been better off if the bloke had given me a half a pound note by mistake. This is no good to me. He tosses it in the nearest garbage can. Except for trouble, and I've already got enough of that. Why is it nothing good ever happens to me? Even what looks good turns out bad in the end. There ain't no pot of gold, and I don't expect there'll be any final reward neither. Reward? My God, there'd be a reward. Augie rushes over to the garbage can and takes out the note, brushes it off and puts it in his pocket carefully. Might be my luck's turned after all. The fool who owns this bloody thing will pay to get it back. He leaves. Henry searches frantically for Augie, accosting everyone he sees who looks down and out, and he finds Scrunch. Did I give you something a few hours ago? Eh? A, a note. Can't read, Governor. No, 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 I mean money. Money. A lot of money. Wouldn't be here now if you did. You've got to help me. Why? Oh, somebody's got to help me. <laughs> That's what I keep saying. I had no luck yet. Good night. Good night. I guess it's hopeless. He's now standing in front of his residence when Lloyd Hastings appears. What's hopeless? Oh, I, I didn't see you, Hastings. Uh, never mind. Now, what's the important matter you want to talk to me about? Once, maybe twice in your life, comes the chance to make a killing, a fortune, a hit. Once, if you're lucky, you know in advance. Well, I'm telling you now, this is it. A gold mine, a gold mine. The thing is a gold mine. Picture it, gentlemen, a grotto of gold. A wonder, a wonder, a bright world down under. Think of it, gentlemen, you gotta be sold. Very interesting. The opportunity of a lifetime. Sounds risky. Believe me, <laughs> it's not. I checked the whole mine out, or rather my clerk did. His name was the same as yours, Henry Adams, and, and it's legitimate. I'm to keep all I get over, over a million dollars. But what's the problem? I pulled every string I knew of, but not one solitary capitalist would buy. Now my option has nearly run out, and, and you're the only person in the world that can save me from ruin. Me? How? Let me use your name. That's all I require. And I know for a fact that we'll sell out before you know it and divide the profits. Share and share alike. We'll be partners. Partners? I don't know you. You almost wrecked my life. My back's throbbing, yes, where I still feel your knife. Understand, please, we've been enemies since. You say about face. Well, I'm hard to convince. What could he possibly mean? I, I, I have no idea. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll just humor him. Sorry. Understood. I'm consumed with regret. But riches could be ours if you forgive and forget. It won't matter if I did what you claim. We'll make millions. All I need is your name. Oh, please, sir. Without your name, I'll be finished. I won't have the money to get back to the States. I'll have to start all over. And, sir, you'll get 60% uh, of the profit. 65. <laughs> then you'll do it? Oh, my God. Thank you, Mr. Adams. 
Those rich Londoners will fight for that stock. I've made, I'm a made man forever. And you, sir, have just made yourself another million. It seems some bad starts can still lead to good ends. Partner, let's shake hands. Someday, perhaps, we'll be friends. Henry and Lloyd shake hands. I guess I'm not as unimaginative, uncommanding, and unlucky as I was two months ago in San Francisco. You're not. No, you, you can't be. Henry Adams? The same. Instead of watching me drown, you're, you're coming to my rescue. I don't deserve it. Oh, I know. <laughs> but we'll be even as soon as you sell that mine stock. You see, Lloyd, I haven't a penny to my name. I'm counting on you to make me a millionaire. <laughs> Why, you old so-and-so. Scene two, a railroad car as Sydney and Roger are returning to London. Sydney is reading the paper. Good Lord, we've missed the investment opportunity of a lifetime. It is that the millionaire, Henry Adams, Never heard of him. Of course you have. He's a famous financier and the power behind some valuable California mine stock, which has sold like hot cross buns. I wonder if there's any left. Poor fellow. What's happened to him? Poor fellow. He's obviously made a fortune. Then what makes you say I've lost a wager? You idiot. I'm talking about the Henry Adams not the penniless, now extinct person to whom we lent the note. We'll see tomorrow when he brings it back. I can hardly wait. Scene three, Portland Place. Augie is still looking for the owner of the note. You'd think it'd be easy low-cutting all right for owner of a million-pound note. Well, it ain't. I've tried my best for a week. Archie walks up. Hey there, Mr. Sir. Go away. I haven't any change. Just hundred pound notes. Must be him. Don't want your hand out, sir. What then? Be quick. Have you lost anything recently? Something sizable? I'll say I have. Bloody good. You found Horatio. Who? My dog. Disappeared a month ago. Where is he? Don't know, sir. Sorry. You looking for a reward? Yes, I mean, no. Haven't seen him, God's truth. Let me know when you're ready to talk. You see, I can't come right out with it, can I? Can't say, excuse me, but have you lost a million pound note? I mean, who would say no? The thing's hopeless. I'll never get rid of the money that's ruining my life. Keeping me from me begging because I feel too rich. Hoggy sits down in front of the Willoughby residence for a rest and a smoke. Sydney and Roger enter. My God, Sydney, there he is, alive and breathing. I've won. I knew it. Alive, but barely. And where are the signs of success? I don't see that he's improved himself a bit. Well, he survived. That's good enough for me. Poor devil, he does look awful. Why is he, he's aged 20 years. Good morning, Augie. This is a joyful reunion. I'm delighted to see you so prompt. Now I'll thank you for the note. You know, the million pound note. You have it, of course. Well, thank you, sir. A little the worse for wear. Well, not to worry. I'll just put it in my pocket. Now for your uh, reward. Right. A suitable situation. Let's see. I'm afraid we'll have to clean you up before I can get some idea of what you could possibly do. I'm not interested in a suitable situation. Indeed, that was the agreement. It's money I'm after. You're not the man we thought you were. I'm terribly sorry. I plan to give you something far more valuable than money. What could that be? The opportunity to become someone. I already am someone. Phenomenal. 
The fellow's only been in London a month and already he's lost his American accent, his American smile, and his American eagerness to please. Very well. Here's 10 pounds. More than enough to get you back to San Francisco. San Francisco? Where's that? The fellow's lost his mind. Right. He's another, here's another 10. Poor man, he'll never work again. I'm afraid our wedger, wager ruined his life. Augie grabs the money and runs off. A dog barks. Get away. Get off. Portia and Mrs. Worth are holding their nets and appear nearby. Oh, that poor defenseless creature. Leave him alone. Stop at once. She casts her net. Aunt Millicent, you let the dog get away. Mrs. Worth returns with Augie in the net. Exactly as I intended, my dear. I have been barking, if you'll forgive me, up the wrong tree. It's not animals that require and appreciate rescue food and shelter. No, it's poor downtrodden men. I've been short-sighted all this time. And now finally I can see. I speak, of course, metaphorically. What's the matter with him? He's not moving. She bends down to examine him. Breathing, but unconscious. Pity. Do you suppose he hit his head when he fell? No matter. It's for the best. If, we were, if he were wide awake, I suppose he would be struggling for what he would perceive as his freedom. But you haven't the right. Calm yourself, child. You'll see. He'll be grateful once he understands. This is the happiest hour of my life. Or would be if only you were safely married. To Henry? To anyone, really. But Henry would be acceptable. I spoke to your uncle this morning about your desire. That is, wish. Mrs. Worth turns to talk to the ambassador as he finishes dressing. My God, I don't believe for a minute that Portia's anything like her mother. Well, if you remember her mother, your sister, poor dear Agatha, took up with the next man who came along after your father broke off her engagements. Mm, without benefit of clergy. Oh, contraire, Reverend Langdon was a man of the cloth. I, I mean, they, they didn't get married. Exactly. Perhaps I was too hasty. Mr. Adams not a bad fellow from what I gather. He's made himself a king's ransom in the market. Bad he was a mining clerk, but we all have to start somewhere, don't we? Yes, uh, I must give it some thought. He's not really an Adams. Don't Ambassador, be... Ambassador Worth leaves. Mrs. Worth turns to face Portia. Don't be discouraged, my dear. Let my sudden success after months of failure inspire you. Patience, patience. They exit, dragging Augie. Next, we find Henry in front of the Willoughby residence. What a feeling! All I had to do was to go to the bank and say, I'd like a million pound note, please. Thank you very much. Gosh! He takes ah. out the note and looks at it. Ah. Now I'm back to where I was a month ago, only with this piece of paper to my name. Hope they can't tell it's not the original. Henry knocks at the Willoughby brothers' door. Pomfret opens it and announces Henry. The brothers are seated in their wing chairs. Mr. Henry Adams. With the million pound note. It's him. Who? The vest pocket millionaire. This is an occasion. We've just been reading about you. What are you doing here? Sorry, rude of me. Delighted to see you, of course. 
Well, I, I, I wanted to just- I, Let I, I me guess. To... Word's gotten to you somehow about our million pound note. Is that it? Well, uh, not, clearly you know, one can usually talk about money to strangers. But if it's our advice what you, that you want, I must tell you straight out, it's unwise to keep money out of circulation unless you stand to win something thereby, which as it happens, I was able to do only recently. You see, for the moment, I too am a best pocket millionaire, but not for long. Right after lunch, I intend to put this money back in the bank where it will earn some interest. And I suggest that you do the same. You say you won something? May I ask what? Americans are an inquisitive lot, but never mind. It's a grand story, even if I did lose. You see, my brother and I had a wager. The scene changes quickly. We see Mrs. Worth, Portia, and the ambassador. You're positive, uncle? Yes, yes, beyond question. Henry, though he doesn't know it, is directly descended from the aristocratic Adamses. I have the proof right here. This is a genealogical tree. Look closely at the small branch toward the bottom and you'll see a very small twig. And coming off that twig is an even, even smaller twig and that is future husband, Henry Adams. That twig may be on his way back to America by now. He's kept his promise, uncle. I haven't seen or heard from him since the night you threw him out. All I know is what I read in the papers. Which a girl of your sensitivity shouldn't do. Imagine making a million dollars overnight. I am so proud of him. I thought you didn't care about money. Oh, I'm sure he'll give a lot of it away to charitable causes. My home for retired thieves and beggars, for example. And the Fabians. Oh, God. Scene four. Henry, Lloyd, and three entrepreneurs are celebrating at the Hog and Toad, toasting and backslapping one another. Here's to our partnership. I don't think I ever apologized to you properly, Henry. I misjudged you in San Francisco, but you've got to admit it all turned out for the best. Well, I, I lost Portia. On the other hand, maybe I didn't misjudge you. <laughs> unimaginative, uncommanding, and unlucky. You were right. If I can support Portia, what do I care about her uncle or what he thinks of me? Damn. I'm going to marry that girl. I'm going to tell her and her hypocrite of an uncle exactly who's in charge here. Who's that? Me. Hot damn. Henry and Lloyd leave. The entrepreneurs remain. I was thinking, if I ever got to be rich, which I am now, that I'd want to do what Henry's going to do. Mary? Have children settle down in a pretty little house with a, a dog. Did I tell you I found a ratio? And give up wheeling and dealing. Scheming and dreaming. All the things we live for. All the things we love. So we could find happiness. Peace. More happiness. I couldn't last a month. A week. A day. Maybe we should wait until we're richer or older or come down with the gout. No need to rush into anything as wonderful as marriage when I've got a buyer for a painting by Da Vinci, though not really by Da Vinci, the buyer thinks it is. Sounds good. Sounds profitable. Sounds risky. So let's do it. He starts to deal here. I close a sale there. And we keeps a tidy profit. Rubies or rifles? Knick-knacking trifles. Rubies or rifles? Knick-knacking trifles. Fish out of water. I'll sell your daughter. Entrepreneurs. 
like some members of our parliament. We're deceitful. But look innocent. Entrepreneurs. Scene five, Henry pounds on the Worth mansion door, then walks in unannounced. I don't care what your uncle says. We're getting married. Where is he anyway? Looking for my fiance. Who? The man I'm going to marry. I, I'll kill him, I swear. Tell me his name. Henry Adams. Henry Adams, eh? Oh, he God. gestures angrily, turns to leave, does a double take. <laughs> what do you think? It's me. <laughs> he sees his Portia and kisses her. Thank God. Vera was despondent and distraught. Life was over, yes. That's what I thought. There I was despairing, seeing red, years of trouble, lay in wait ahead. Then like your fortune, never secure. Suddenly rich and suddenly poor. Things turned around, things turned around, things can be lost and found. Here we are, and now it's the same as when. We held hands, we're holding your hands again. Things turn around, yes, things turn around. Our love was lost, and now it's found. Portia and Henry embrace. Ah, uh, well, what made your uncle change his mind? Never mind, I'm pretty sure I know. It's the money. Oh, he is such a hypocrite. You're right. <laughs> but I'm not marrying him. <laughs> no. I'm marrying you for your goodness, your beauty, your integrity. And I'm marrying you for your money, among other things, my millionaire. I fed him, I dressed him, I know all about him. He, he smiled, smiled at me, he spoke to me, I can't do without him. He's truly a noble man, someone to look up to, trustworthy and high-minded, who I'm wanting to lift my cup to. He's handsome, broad-shouldered, he gives me a fever. He's righteous, angelic, I'm his true believer. Tip-top, all right, he's lovely, quite extraordinary. He's famous. He's my millionaire. I saw him, I loved him, at long last, I know him. He winked at me, he toasted me, I've something to show him. He's truly a noble man, someone to bow down for. Noteworthy, big hearted, whom I'm wanting to lift my gown for. He's thoughtful and well-mannered. He kindles my fire. He's decent and keen-witted, traits I most admire. Tip-top, all right. He's lovely, quite extraordinary. He's famous. He's my millionaire. My millionaire. Fini. He winked at me and he toasted me.